All right. So I think everyone's heard about canonical layouts now, um, but we're going to talk about them a little more. Um, I'm Liam Spradlin. I'm a senior design advocate on material design. Uh, and I wanted to uh, do this talk with Daniel to dive a little bit deeper, not only on the ideas and significance behind canonical layouts, but also how to implement them in a few different ways. Yes. And why should you care about this talk? So we briefly introduced the large screen quality tiers, and we mentioned that the best way to achieve tier two or, or some of the biggest issues we see with apps gating them from achieving tier two is related to UI and layout. And so the learnings from this talk will help you achieve that piece of, of the large screen quality guidelines for tier two so you can provide the best possible experience for your end users. Um, there's more detail in the three tiers of large screen quality on Google Play Talk if you want to learn more specifically about the tiers. But now let's get into the canonical layouts design philosophy. Sure. So as you heard in the last talk, the canonical layouts are based on what we know about a large sample of apps. Uh, we've developed three canonical layouts that seek to address a lot of the broad questions about how apps can and should adapt as you move between different screen types and sizes so that you can focus on the questions that are more specific to your product. We're going to dive into each of these layouts one by one and see what's going on inside each of them so that when you're making those decisions for your own app, you'll be doing so with an understanding of the layout's rationale and how all the pieces fit together. First, we have the list detail, which is, again, a parent-child relationship where you have two panes that are directly uh, in line in the navigation hierarchy with each other. Next, we have the supporting panel where you have a primary and secondary pane that are not necessarily subsequent to each other in the navigation hierarchy, but both important and integral to one another. And then finally, we have the feed layout where, where all of the panels are peers or siblings in the, in the hierarchy. And if you've had a chance to make yourself familiar with Material Design's large screen design guidance, then you're probably familiar with the idea of layout regions that kind of supersedes all of this. These are containers that form a framework for thinking about how interfaces scale across those different screens based on the ways most compositions end up breaking down based on behavior, content, and function. First region is the navigation region. This contains navigation components like the navigation rail or the navigation drawer, and it helps users navigate between destinations inside an app or to access important actions. Second is the app bar region, which is also kind of self-explanatory. It's used to display and group components and actions that will help users perform key tasks or take action on elements inside. Number three, the body region which displays most of the content in an app. So this is where you're going to find most of your components, like lists, cards, buttons, and images. Before we get into more details about each of the three individual canonical layouts, we're going to go through a lot of material that's going to vary in complexity. Uh, the reason I'm showing this is because everything we review is available here. So we're going to go, go into development guidance, including sample code and sample apps. All of those are public on GitHub. We basically tried to build the easiest way to implement each of these. So you can refer to those as a reference or a baseline for your own application. Um, additionally, everything is going to be grounded in window size class layout breakpoints. While we do have the new utility library for Compose, there are easy ways to implement window size class based logic in views layouts as well, and we'll review how to do some of that. And last but not least, before we get into the details, don't worry about the complexity on this slide yet. Um, it looks really complex, and the reason is because there are many existing ways to build UI and layout in Android. And we know, depending on how you built your app in the past, we've heard this time and time again from developers, that kind of dictates the easiest way for you to implement your large screen optimized layout in the future. And we want to make that choice easier for you. So really, only one of these green boxes is probably going to be applicable to each of your own applications, which simplifies the complexity a lot. But this flow chart will help get you, get you there. And we'll go through each of these in step-by-step -step details. So back to the list detail canonical layout. Here's an example. What can we see going on here? Um, in this example, we're dealing primarily with a body region that I mentioned before. And it allocates a variable number of columns in the layout between the list and detail subregions or panels. And I say variable because as you continue to adapt to larger screens, the two panels may become asymmetric. The main things to remember with the list detail layout, as with many layouts, are the relationships between the primary regions in the layout and the visual hierarchy that allows people using your app to more quickly complete a mental model that helps them understand how it works. For list detail, the relationship between our two panels is pretty simple. Um, the detail is at the deepest level of the navigation hierarchy, and it's subordinate to the list. In this arrangement, the user is straightforwardly navigating one level deep from the list into the detail. 
This is even true for more complicated list detail layouts like we see here in the reply email app. It adds a navigation region, which is at the top level of the hierarchy and, and affects the entire content region with the capability to access several different list detail screens or even full body features like video calling. In terms of how a user builds their mental model from this, the list detail guides users directionally from the navigation to the list and finally to the detail. And it traverses that same visual hierarchy in a visual sense as well, because the detail, which is in this case an email thread, is the primary focus of the screen. It's the most dynamic task. It's elevated at a higher level than the list of emails, which is in turn elevated at a higher level than the navigation region, which appears to rest on the background. In this way, the hierarchy is made clear not only by directionality of the layout, but also by visual treatments. And from there, the normal markers of emphasis and action like type styles and button containment apply within each discrete thread or message. So this is probably the most common example of the canonical layouts that we see in practice. A lot of applications have a cha parent-child content relationship. So let's figure out how you can build it. Um, so trying to simplify this flowchart already, really there's a couple of decisions you'll need to consider when building a list detail layout. And we're going to go through two of the three right now. Um, we're going to skip over Compose for list detail because we're going to review it in supporting panel. And conceptually, they're very similar. But starting with... If you have UI content spread across multiple activities within your application, we now have a solution for you to easily implement a list detail optimized layout called Activity Embedding. What is Activity Embedding? Activity Embedding is a new platform feature supported on devices running Android 12L and later that lets you display UI content for multiple activities from your own application within a single task with just configuration. It's very easy to implement. It's kind of the, the shortcut to a list detail layout, if you will, if you're using multiple activities. Um, and let's take a look. So this is pretty much most of what you would need to do to implement activity embedding within an existing application. It's primarily configuration driven, meaning you just add a new XML configuration file to your application, and then you register that rule at runtime with like a single line of code. Uh, we'll go into more detail in a later talk. Um, but basically what you'll do is you'll define a placeholder rule and you'll create a placeholder activity. This will be like the default navigation. The first time a user opens the application, what should you show in the detail pane? And then you can configure your primary and secondary activity split configuration in the split pair rule, including the ratio. So how much of the con or the display should be given to the primary activity versus the secondary activity? When should I actually show this split? So what is the min width? In this case, we're picking the medium width device category of 600. DP. And what's really great about activity embedding as well is with Jetpack library support, you can implement it in your existing application with down level support. So you don't have to like fork your application to only support this. And the behavior is going to be unchanged on devices that don't support activity embedding or on devices that don't meet the split min width uh, value. So basically, you're only improving the experience on large screens without touching the experience on all other devices. It's, it's a really simple, easy way to get a better experience for list detail applications. You'll learn more about this in the Do More with Multi-Window and Activity Embedding talk. Next is, we're going to skip over the Compose, like I mentioned, uh, a views-based solution. Say you're using multiple fragments called Sliding Pane Layout. This is a Jetpack library that lets you embed multiple fragments side by side. And we've done a lot of the work for you to basically create a more dynamic and adaptive experience. So similarly, once your application doesn't meet the width criteria based off of the width of each of the two fragments, um, we will go back to the single pane view versus the two pane view in a sliding pane layout. In addition, recent updates to the library now will take it uh, into consideration a physical hinge. So if the device has a physical hinge splitting the displays, it will split the content over that so you don't have to worry about that. It does all that for you. It's a, another really great way to build a, a, a simple simple list detail layout with little effort. Uh, to use it, you basically have your two fragments. In this case, we have a recycler view with a list of elements that is contained on the left. And then we have the details contained on the right. And those are just the two child elements to the sliding pane layout, uh, layout in general. OK, moving on to the supporting panel layout. As you can probably tell from the name and from this example screen, this layout also relies on a primary and secondary panel. But compared to the list detail, you'll immediately notice that the directionality of the layout has changed. Here, the primary focus panel, which is still at the highest elevation, is more towards the center of the layout because the supporting panel doesn't necessarily exist outside the context of the primary panel. The primary and secondary focal points are considered equally important and contain different content. Um, and both panels can scroll independently of one another. 
Like before, the panels share a space inside the body region of the layout using a variable number of columns. But generally, the primary panel is going to use more space. In terms of information hierarchy, the supporting panel is secondary and still complementary to the primary. Um, because of the relationship between these panels, the supporting panel can also appear at different points on the screen. So here we see an example on a taller screen where it uses the supporting panel to show comments on a doc. The comments are providing useful context to the doc, but in terms of the information hierarchy of the screen, they're still secondary to the content of the doc itself. So just to summarize, if you have a primary secondary content relationship within your UI and layouts, supporting panel is a great large screen optimized layout choice for you. And let's learn how to build it. So this time we will go into Compose. We're not going to explore all of the Compose concepts here, just the adaptive layout piece. You'll learn more about Compose in a later talk. Um, but we have a new two-pane composable in our accompanist library that makes this much easier for you. So what you can do with a supporting panel layout if you wanted to configure your own is use this new two-pane composable to basically determine your display or presentation strategy. So in a compact width case, again, I'm using that new window size class utility library here, I can basically split the content vertically 50-50 in this case. And in a medium width case, oops, sorry, there you can see the, the second composable. In a medium width case, I can split it horizontally 50-50, and I've got my main and supporting content. And we'll go into a lot more detail on this one in a later talk on Compose, implementing responsive UI for larger screens. And there's another talk as well about navigation in Compose to figure out the best way to adapt your navigation model for these types of layouts. Another option for building a great supporting panel UI is using resource qualified layouts with a number of existing views based layout APIs. Uh, so for example, we'll use a linear layout API in this example, where we have our activity main XML file that is not resource qualified. This would be the default layout that is inflated on a device that is basically going to use a vertical orientation for this linear layout to again split the content top to bottom. And we'll basically set the weight equally so that it'll be a 50-50 split. And you could adjust this for your own app needs. And then when we go into a medium width layout, note, note the resource qualifier here. It is not smallest width. It is width. That's intentional. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a second as well. But in this case, I would split the content horizontally. And again, I can do a 50-50 split on like a typical foldable inner display. Going back to this statement from before, because I'm really passionate about it. Don't do is tablet like Boolean logic. And the reason why we don't want you to use smallest width based logic is thinking about freeform windowing cases. So on a Chrome OS device, when you reduce the height of an application window, it's really weird to then reduce the amount of usable horizontal space in the application. So if I use smallest width and I have a two pane layout and I shrink the height of my window and then I lose the two pane layout to a one pane layout, that's a really unexpected and unusual user experience. If you're using just width as your resource qualifier, then when you shrink the width of the application window, you might lose that secondary pane, and that is much more intuitive than, than the alternative. So again, don't use this. Uh, for those on the live stream, check out this optimizing apps for large screen Susan Don'ts talk for more on why not to use this tablet. Um, going back into that, so now the expanded width layout, so we're using 840 dp as our width-based layout qualifier, and the only thing we're changing here is the layout weight. So it's really just two lines of code. The one disadvantage, and we hear this from developers with resource qualifiers, is you now have the same UI elements split across multiple files. And so the one word of caution as well as reminder is if you're making updates or changes to your UI and layouts that are resource qualified, don't forget to make them in all resource qualified versions of those layouts. Um, it creates a little bit of extra maintenance cost, but the delta between each of the different files is so small, it's generally not that hard for to, to do the upkeep and to keep them maintained. Okay, finally, we have the feed. Um, and from the name and its prevalence across products, I bet you can already guess a lot of the details. Um, a feed is a grid layout that's composed of a lot of distinct but related items that are all on the same level as each other in both the visual and navigational hierarchy. Um, here, instead of just a horizontal directionality for our app layout, we have the horizontal flavor of the layout regions with the navigation and body regions with a vertically scrolling grid structure. And since all items in the feed have similar elevation treatment, emphasis among them ends up coming from things like size, type treatments, and color. Here, navigation can access multiple different feed layouts, while items in a feed are all providing entry points to content deeper in the app. 
With a feed layout, you could conceivably allow the user to enter a list detail by selecting a story, but you can just as easily provide an immersive experience by giving body region entirely to that story. Because of the grid-based layout, um, it's one of the most straightforward in terms of the division of space. By using the entire body region for the grid, it scales really easily to larger screens. Just to recap, a feed layout is a great choice if you have content of equal weight or equal relationships, where maybe you want to highlight one or the other, but generally they're of equal importance. And as Liam mentioned, this is one of the easier things to think about from like an adaptive concept point of view. If you're using views or compose, you're going to use respective grid-based controls, and you're going to change the number of columns, basically, the number of layout columns to fit more or less content on the screen, depending on what's available. So let's take a look at that in action, starting with compose using lazy grid controls. So in this case, we have a custom feed composable that was authored, which is basically a fancy wrapper around a lazy vertical grid control. And what I'm doing to that is adding some own, my own custom column logic, again, using window size class. So my actual suites feed uh, composable, which is the one that you see rendered on the right, is going to pass in uh, a window size class value and then call a utility function in the application to figure out the number of columns to display based off of the available space. So in this case, in a compact width environment, like a typical phone, it's going to be a grid with one column or a kind of a list of cards, if you will. It's a very similar layout. If it's medium width, it'll be a grid with two columns. And then if it's expanded, it'll be a dynamic grid that will do the number of columns that so long as each grid column can have at least 240 dp width. So the number of grids will grow or shrink, and Compose APIs make that really, really easy to do. This is what it would look like in practice uh, using the resizable emulator. So if you want to try it out, um, you can easily test it at runtime and make sure that the adaptive logic is working as expected. Taking a look at views, you're going to use uh, Recycler View as your base controller but then you're going to basically change the layout adapter based off of the available display space. So in this case, we're going to inflate that feed-based layout, and we're going to do some logic to figure out how many columns to use. This is the most naive and simple implementation of this. If you don't need the, the, the best solution, this is better than not doing anything at all. You can, again, use resource-qualified values to determine a static number of columns. So in this case, compact is one, medium is two, and expanded would be a fixed five. You could use Jetpack Window Manager APIs to get display metrics and change Change this in code if you want to get more complex and advanced. Um, it's not that hard to do, but the samples that we publish are the easiest possible ways to achieve each of these layouts, and this is really the easiest way to do it. And then based off of those values, you'll pass in the number of columns to uh, your layout manager and will change to either a linear layout manager or a grid layout manager if you have more than one column and it will result in this type of layout. So you can see in this case, I will always have five uh, columns and an expanded width layout. The size of the columns will vary based off of the display uh, size, but it will always be five. Uh, with that, we hope you take a look at the resources, take a look at the samples, and can use them to build these layouts in your own applications. Thank you. Thank you.